Let's get our seats. Everybody, praise the Lord. It's time to get started. I appreciate that. It's wonderful to be in church, amen? Wonderful to be in the house of God. What a blessing. Good to have you here tonight. i tell you one thing. Uh, I love coming to church. How about you? Amen, amen. amen. And uh, I know the place I'd be. You got a little humming up here. Let's get that humming out, okay? If you don't, if you don't get it right, we're going to fire you <laughs> next year. <laughs> we, get somebody re- we can't fire you to get somebody to replace you, okay? <laughs> All right. Well, you're glad to be here. Amen. 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 I'm glad to be here also. And we got some visitors here tonight. Thank you so much. Every visitor makes a service that's that much better. And I thank the Lord for it. And we'll uh, be greeting you in just a few moments and saying hello to you. And uh, we're just glad to have you here. Trust that the Lord will speak to your heart tonight and speak to every heart here. And we were in the prayer room praying a few moments ago. I prayed, Lord, I pray this every time. Lord, uh, bind Satan. Amen. Don't let him have any influence in the service. Right. If he wants to interrupt, dear God, you interrupt his interruption. Amen. And Lord, uh, there are going to be folks here tonight that's got all kinds of issues in their life, all kinds of issues, all kinds of situations and that nobody knows about but them and God. I'm glad that God knows about it. Sure. And he can help you in every situation in life. Amen, right. amen. Let's pray. And then we're going to sing number 267 in your hymn book. And, uh, but let's go ahead and pray and ask God to bless the service. Lord Jesus, thank you for another wonderful day you've given us. We thank you, Lord, for the wonderful salvation that you have bestowed upon those who have called upon you as Lord and Savior, been born again. And Lord, I know, know tonight if everybody's here saved or not, Lord, I believe most of them are, and, but you know, and they know. And so God, for somebody in the bill tonight that's never been born again, never been saved, I pray, Holy Spirit, you'll prick their heart, convict right. them, draw them to yourself. And Lord, this will be the night, this will be the time they'll come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'll help those who are saved. Lord, those who are going through some tough times in our life right now, Lord, facing some things, dear God, that seems un- insurmountable, but we're so glad, dear God, that what's impossible with man is possible with you. So, God, you intervene tonight and have your way. Help us to worship you, dear God, for you're worthy of all the praise we can give you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's all stand, number 267. Let's all stand and sing.
good singing tonight, amen. amen. While you remain standing, let's turn back to page number 92. Page number 92, I'm glad that one day we're going to tour that city, That's amen. Right. Tour in that city. <laughs> that kind of stuff, don't you? And uh, I don't know if we're going to need a tour up there. We're going to be there a long time. And I don't know if we'll need a tour. But we're going to be, we're going to be what we are now. No heartache, no sorrow. Yes, sir. We're going to be like the Lord, glorified body. Don't, don't that excite you yes, sir. to know that you're saved, what's waiting on you across the divide? And uh, so I like what the preacher said last night. I've said it, you've said it many times, to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. And it won't take, it won't take a week to get there either. No, sir. Get there in a moment, a twinkling of an eye. Amen. It's good having you tonight. Appreciate your visitors here. And some I recognize, some I hadn't met before. Lady over here, just met her. It's good having you here. What a blessing it is. And then over here, we got some more visitors. Uh, got the preacher here again. How you doing, preacher? Hey, you doing okay? Amen. Can you talk? Okay, all right, so I don't want to know. I think so. You got an amen in you? Amen. Uh, and he's a good preacher too, eh? Good to have him with his back, amen. Back here in the back is my barber. He keeps my hair, this light makes my hair glow. You like that? Makes your haircut look good? All right. It's good to have him Brother Jonathan Hoover here. Brother Jonathan, how you doing, brother? I tell you what, uh, got a sweet spirit. I love, I love Brother Jonathan. I knew his dad real well. And uh, brother, brother Hilton Hoover and his mother. And uh, in my opinion, he's got the same spirit they had. And uh, I appreciate that, Brother Jonathan. Matter of fact, I was up there this morning at your place. You know that? I had to get my tires rotated, oil changed, all that kind of stuff. And, and did a good job. Amen. And uh, so I appreciate you for being here tonight. It really blesses my heart. Other visitors are here. Thank you for being with us. I thank the Lord. Going through Thursday night, each night at 7 o'clock. Hope you'll be here tomorrow night now. Uh, each month we have a a monthly birthday supper, and we'll have it tomorrow night. And uh, if you don't have a church home or looking for a church, you come out and be with us at 530. We'll meet in the dining hall, have a good meal, good time of fellowship. Then we'll meet here at 7 for uh, the revival services, and then again on Thursday at 7 o'clock. Amen. Wasn't that some good preaching last night? 
As a matter of fact, that's great preaching last night. And I told him, I told him Sunday, brother, I said, now, brother, Cody is not a speaker. You hear people say, well, come here. He, this guy is a great speaker. Uh, and, I, and that's nothing wrong with that. But uh, I like preaching. Amen. I like preaching. And so, and the uh, uh, Bible talks about teachers with itching ears. And you get to preaching, I'll take care of that itching, all right. <laughs> Amen. All right, we do have restrooms right down the hallway here. Uh, right before you get to the end of the hallway, the men's are right there. Right in, go in the hallway on the right, it's the ladies' restroom. And to the left is a nursery. And uh, so they're there. And, uh, but anyway, just let God speak to your heart tonight. We're sure are glad to have you. Right now, the choir is going to sing a couple of songs. I hope it will bless your heart.
come again. Aren't you glad of that? Right on the other side. Uh, it's just a place waiting for you. Let's stand for a few moments and speak to each other just for a little bit. Say hello to your neighbor. Standing's got to sing a special all by himself. The last one standing. I'm looking, I'm looking. Okay. Got, still got that ringing up here, Chris. All right. Last one standing. Oh, Miss Nancy. Oh, Kylie. Oh, you and Kylie sit down at the same time. So y'all got to come and sing a duet, Kylie, with Miss Nancy. She's smiling back there. Well, I tell you what. I tell you what. That was the two great songs the choir sang, wasn't it? And you know what I like about it? We get that every Sunday. Every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, we get that kind of singing. I like it. it, it, it I tell folks sometimes to come to church, I said, I hope you come to get preaching, but if you don't, you get some good singing. <laughs> Amen. All right, we are going to have some special singing, and we're going to have one right now. Brother Denny Farrell's going to come. And uh, uh, sometimes Denny let me know what he's going to sing. Sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he surprises us and... You know, just <laughs> you know, like flipping a coin. But everything, everything you've done thus far has been good. You got a new one for us tonight? No, it's old. It, Ain't nothing special. <laughs> it is special. You've seen it, Brother Denny. Well, What's the name of it? it? It's called Dan Render. Oh, yeah, we know that one. I know. See, told me. Okay, you see. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't going to sing this, but Cody went and sang half the song I was going to sing last night, so I kind of had to do emergency backup plan, so here we are. <laughs> but um, on the upside, it's a song all of you know. So whenever we get to the chorus, if you want to jump in, then just do, yeah. because that might just mean you actually agree with what we're singing. Yeah. I mean, preachers want you to amen them, but they really want you to shut up and listen and then amen them. But I just just do something, okay? Because we're supposed to be reviving, right? You can't revive sitting there. See. Okay. <laughs> I'm satisfied with just a cottage below. A little silver and a little gold. But in that city where the ransomed will shine, I want a gold one that's silver line. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never 
never grow old. And someday under, we will never more wander, but walk the streets that are pure as gold. Though often tempted, tormented and tested, and like the prophet, my pillow was stone. And though I find here no permanent dwelling, I know he'll give me a mansion my own. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday under, we will never more wander, but walk the streets that are pure as gold. Don't think me poor or deserted or lonely. I'm not discouraged. I'm heaven bound. I'm just a pilgrim in search of a city. I want a mansion, a harp and a crown. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday under, we will never more wander, but walk those streets that are pure as gold. Amen. 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 Aren't you glad you got one? Yes, sir. That's a repaying full. It's going to be. If you're saved, that's if you're saved now, okay? If you're not saved, you're not going there. You won't be on the street of gold. You'll be in the lake of fire. And ain't nothing to laugh about, so nobody take that serious. Eternity's, eternity's forever. And you're gonna spend eternity in a place, a wonderful place called heaven or a horrible place called hell. And Jesus is the difference. Amen. So I thank the Lord for that. You know, think about that song. That's a, that's a really old, old timey song. But it's just, as, it's just as updates anything you got coming on the scene today. And, uh, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of generations that miss that kind of songs. And when they hear it now, they say, boy, that's a good song. Who, who, when did that come on the scene? Oh, about 80 years ago. Oh, really? Yeah. And uh, so uh, those, are, those are great songs. Well, I mentioned last night that we will receive an offering each night for our visiting evangelist, Brother Cody. And uh, so everything you give will uh, go to him and his family and his wife. They've got their four children. And uh, they over here in our guest house, and I went over here today and went in and had a little sandwich with them. And, uh, of course, there's three girls and a boy. And, and goes, I, so I called him last night, and I let him know that the, the couches will fold out the bed. And he said, I don't mind about that. So I came in today. Well, anyway, they all sleeping in the floor. They took the mattresses, put them in the floor. They all just sleeping in the floor. Did you do that when you was a kid? You like sleeping in the floor? When I was a kid, I'd rather sleep on the floor than in bed any time. But now, I want the bed. I don't want no floor. So they're having the time of their life over there, and I'm glad they are. So everything you give this week will go to him. And uh, the Lord always has, lays upon my heart what i like to see us give our visiting preachers. And, and uh, so if we don't get that in the offer, we'll make up for it. I'm thankful for a church that loves giving. I'm thankful that the Lord over the years has blessed us. And, and uh, this coming, this coming uh, June, Miss Baker and I will be here 41 years. And... Uh, we have seen, we have witnessed God do things that only God could do in a little country church. Amen. And I, know that, I don't know the exact number, so I just sort of estimated over the 40 and a half years I've been here. And right now we're helping support right at 80, right at 80, about 78 to 80 missionary works around the world. And over the last 40 years, and, this, and we're talking about a church out in the country, God has helped us give over $2 million to missions. Isn't that something? Now listen, 
you better lift up your hand and say, thank you, Lord. Because I got news for you. Only God could do that. And that's a tribute to his amazing grace and tender mercies. And we give him all the honor and all the glory and all the praise. And I'm just saying, let's just keep it up. Amen. I've tried to over the years to teach them and, 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 and they're very, they've been so teachable and learning. Love preachers. Love preachers. Love preachers' wives. <laughs> Matter of fact, we got ladies in our church. If, if, I, if I don't be good to the preacher's wife, they'll, they just let me know. What about the preacher's wife? What about the preacher's wife? And uh, so we will always want to be good to the preachers and their wives and give them a good offering. And so everything you give will go uh, to Brother Cody and his wife and his four kids. Amen. Isn't that good? Aren't you glad a part, you're a part of that? Amen. Isn't that good? I like that. Wonderful Savior. Wonderful Savior. All right, we're going to sing a couple of verses of a song. And what number is it? 249. 249. We're going to receive tonight's offering. 249. Amen. All right, let's all stand. We'll sing the first and last of Heaven Came Down and Glory Filled My Soul. Amen. Amen. Let's sing it Amen. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend, He met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, I am telling, He made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory Just happened to glance down at the at the offering, the salad bowl. We had two of them, and uh, we've had several folks over the years want to buy new offering plates and you know those pretty shiny cameras. That's, that's okay. I said, no, let's keep these. You imagine how many, how much has come through these two little plates over the years? A lot of bread. A lot of matter from heaven come through here over the years. And uh, so I tell you what, isn't that amazing? I was thinking about when we first started with missions. First missionary we took home gave him $15 a month. And we were excited that we had a missionary we could help with $15 a month. <laughs> he might not have been too excited. We was thrilled. Everybody gave a nickel. <laughs> Or something like that. And then we got this and got that. And so over the years, it's just sort of climbed up there. And so we, we're, we just, it's just a trust address. Brother Rick Parker, it's good to have you, preacher. Thank you for coming tonight. And now would you pray and ask God to bless the offering. Our Father, God tonight, it has been a joy already to be in the house. Yes, Lord. Yes. Yes, Lord. Yes, God. Yes. Yes, Lord. Yes. Yes. Amen, amen, amen.
Sister Fisher's our, our organist, but she played the piano a little bit too. <laughs> our organist is not feeling well tonight. Couldn't, I mean, our pianist is not feeling well. Couldn't be here tonight, so she swapped over. And uh, so I'm glad she can do both. Amen. Thank the Lord for that. Miss Baker's going to come now right before preaching and uh, sing for us. She's going to also play the piano. I don't know why she didn't ask me to help her sing this song, but anyway. Amen. Y'all pray for it, okay? wander in the cold and you can be saved. Right. You don't have to go through life miserable and all that kind of stuff. You can be saved and have the joy of the Lord. Well, let's sit up straight now and get our Bibles out. I like that. Get your Bibles out. And uh, Brother Zorn's going to come and some of you have never heard him preach. Will you? This, you you're fixing to meet him. And uh, preached last night on uh, faith and uh, associating faith with gold. And uh, boy, that was good stuff, wasn't it? I mean, that was really a great message. So, Brother Cody, you come on now. It's good having you back with us again this year. And we sure appreciate you and your wife and kids. And, Amen, and uh, just preach what God's given you, my friend. Thank you, preacher. Right. Jeremiah chapter number 18 tonight. If you have your Bibles, Jeremiah chapter number 18, be where we draw our text this evening. And uh, so glad to see you in church tonight. And many of you was here last night, and thank God you came back again tonight. It's always a blessing to have somebody come out here and preach once, and it's always 
a shocker that they come back twice, Brother Baker, amen. That's right. Man, it's free country. You didn't have to come, amen. I guess you wanted to come. I don't reckon Brother Baker's giving you $100 bills under the table when you come in. And uh, I appreciate you coming tonight. It's good to have you. And uh, appreciate the brother, having Brother Rick Parker and Miss Shadow here tonight, one of my dearest friends in this entire world. We've run all over the country together. And dear God, if I stood up here and started telling you stories about me and him preaching together in different meetings here, there, and yonder, and he was to stand up and tell some stories, well, we'd be here all night, and then our sides would start hurting from all the laughing we'd be doing. And uh, we've seen some things and been to some places, and uh, but through it all, the Lord's been good, and uh, and it's good to have friends. Amen. It's good to have friends. Eh? There, I, uh, there ain't nothing I wouldn't do for Brother Rick Parker, and there's nothing Brother Parker wouldn't do for me, so we just go around doing nothing for each other. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. That's right. <laughs> but it's good to have friends. Amen. We're glad that they're here, and I'm glad that you all are here too. And uh, I know some of you worked all day long, come, some, come straight from work or ran straight to the house and come. That blesses my heart. Blesses my heart. Don't bother me a bit to have you come in work clothes. Amen. Right. That just tickles me to death that you're here. You don't got to be right. and uh, that you come. Blesses my heart. Thank you so much. Visitors that are here, we're glad that you came. Jeremiah chapter number 18 tonight. Thank you so much, choir, for the good singing and the special singing and the special playing. Man, last night and tonight, the choir just did a jam-up job, and I appreciate that. I, um, I have undertaken leading the choir uh, at the church where God's put us at now. And if there's one thing I have realized just over the last two weeks or so in choir practice and leading the choir is that a good-sounding choir don't get that way by accident. Uh, it, it takes time and preparation and practice and a passion from the people that's doing it. That's right. So uh, I appreciate the time that you've put into it. I know Sunday afternoons for a choir gets real short because you have to meet and practice and things of that nature. I appreciate all that you're doing there. It means a lot, I know, to the pastor uh, to have something like that before he gets up to preach. Yeah. I've preached yeah. before bad singing before, and uh, it's rough, it's rough. He meant to have to yank something out of the ditch when it's gone <laughs> astray. Uh, it, it is. It's tough to have to get her out of the ditch, man. It's, uh, I only know one man can resurrect the dead, and there's been some times after the singing was over, I was convinced he wasn't there. <laughs> Amen. And I, and I couldn't bring him back to life. And so it's good to come somewhere where you don't got to resurrect the dead after the singing's done. People's charged up, ready for preaching. And uh, thank you so much for that tonight. Jeremiah chapter 18, I want to begin reading in verse number 7. We'll read down through verse number 12 tonight. If you found your place with me in your Bible, somebody say amen. amen. Those of it that ain't found your place, we're going to go ahead and read. You catch up in a little bit. Verse number 7, Jeremiah chapter 18. The Lord said, at one instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. Those two verses ought to give great consolation to us as Americans tonight that if we'll turn our face toward God and make our ways and our doings good, that God will repent of the judgment that he would send our way. I still believe our children can see a measure of revival. I still believe our country can see God do something. Yeah, national revival may never come, but I believe we can see pockets of revival here, there, and yonder if we'll apply the Bible recipe to our lives and to our homes and to our churches. Verse 9, the Lord said that what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. Now therefore go to, speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I frame evil against you and devise a device against you. Return you now, every one, from his evil way and make your ways and your doings good. And I want you to notice Israel's response to God's merciful measures 
to restore them, to revive them, to reinstate them, to give them a blessing in their life. Notice what they say to God when he offers them grace, when he outstretches his mighty arm towards them. And they said, watch these four words tonight, there is no hope. But we will walk after our own devices and we will everyone do the imagination of his evil heart. I'm interested in the first part of verse 12 where God gives them an opportunity to repent. God gives them an opportunity for revival. And God's people, Israel looks straight at God and straight at his messenger and this is what they say. Preacher, there's no hope for us. God, there's just no hope for us. We have gone too far. We've messed up too much. We've slid so far backwards. We're down too low. There is no hope. I want to use this text tonight and I'm preaching on this thought. I'm preaching on there is always hope. There is always hope hope tonight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the good sweet things our ears have heard and our hearts have already experienced up to this point in the service. The singing's been good and the fellowship of God's people's been great and it's just been a blessing to come through the doors and see you folk gathered around, see visitors in the building, dear friends here, there, and yonder. God, I'm privileged to be here and to be among them. I pray tonight that you'd bless this place, smile upon us for a few minutes, the sweet spirit that we've already already felt, let it linger with us now for the next few moments as I try and preach the word of God. I, I'm leaning heavy on the everlasting arms. I need your touch tonight. I realize I can't get across the message. I am not sufficient to accomplish the task of the hour, but you are. And I've seen you help me and I've seen you work before. So I'm asking you to do it one more time, Lord. And we'll thank you and we'll praise you and we'll give you the glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and a amen. Here in our text we find Jeremiah, one of the most famous prophets that God ever calls and uses to minister to a group of people. And I find the group of people that God calls Jeremiah to minister to is one of the toughest crowds that God ever asks a preacher to preach to. I don't guess there's a tougher crowd, Preacher Baker, that God has ever asked a preacher to work with and to minister to and to preach to than the crowd that God gives Jeremiah to preach to. Uh, This crowd, let me say several things about this crowd on the way to the message. This crowd is a hard crowd. They are are hardened people tonight. God calls Jeremiah in chapter 1, you read it for yourself, but in chapter number 1, God calls Jeremiah out and he said, I've set you apart, ordained you to be a a, a prophet among the nations. I want you to preach my word. Jeremiah said, but Lord, I'm just a child. I can't speak and I can't do what you've asked me to do. And he said, Jeremiah, I've formed you in the belly. I know what you are. You just go open your mouth and I'm going to help you. And I imagine Jeremiah's thinking to himself, Brother Parker, well Lord uh, if I'm going to have to go do something maybe I don't even necessarily want to do and preach to a crowd that maybe necessarily I don't even want to preach to surely God's going to give me a real good crowd to preach to. I mean when I preach they're going to smile and nod their head and say amen. They're going to pat me on the back on the way out the door and say oh we love you preacher. I mean, you know, they're going to say how what a wonderful message it was. and I mean, they're just going to be a real good crowd. But God lets Jeremiah know real quick that ain't going to be your crowd, Jeremiah. He says this about the crowd in chapter 1. He says, be not dismayed at their faces. Uh, in other words, don't be scared when you look at their faces. It's going to be a scary looking group because when you preach, they ain't going to smile or nod their head this way or even say amen. They're going to frown and cross their arms and scowl at you, stick their tongue out while you preach and shake their head no this way and poke their ears and I mean they gonna just not give a flip about what you got to say Jeremiah on the way out the door they gonna criticize you they gonna hate your guts gonna be a real hard crowd you got to deal with I'll be honest with you in the years that I've preached around this country and God's let me preach I preached some real tough crowd before I I mean some folks I'll be honest with you 
you by the time the week was over, I was glad to be gone. Amen. I mean, you know, they, they'd walk by you out the door and you think, dear God, I believe these folk could kill me if they could get away with it. I, I mean, I wasn't even trying to be ugly, rude, or hateful. They just didn't like anything from God. I'll be honest with you. The crowd I preach to up there, if any time I ever think that I've got a hard crowd, I'm just going to read Jeremiah and say, Lord, thank you for my crowd. That old boy had a tough crowd. I Thank you for the crowd I get to preach to. Amen. May I say this? We're living in that kind of generation. We're living in a hard generation. Would you agree with me that even some of you that's been in church 25, 30 years, 40 years, you, you have seen the evolution of a generation without God that has become hardened to the gospel, hardened to preaching, hardened to singing. Used to be a preacher, get up, preach on hell, and folk would weep and cry, and conviction would set in. And folk that was saved, they, they'd go pray for their family and cry over them. And folk that was lost to get under conviction, whether they got saved or not, you could see an evident manifestation of God working in their life. But preacher Baker, it ain't like that no more. I mean, I can preach in youth camps to kids that are 14, 15, 16 years old. And it's like you preaching to hardened criminals down in the penitentiary somewhere. Preach on hell and they cross their arms and get mad and sit there and look at you and say, you can't scare me, preacher. I've heard worse than that this week on the TV. I've watched worse than that on the internet. I mean, we live in a hard generation, brother. We're living in a generation that can't respond no more. I mean, I mean, they're gone. I don't know where they are, but they're blanked out. I mean, you, you can't tell what's going on in their mind or in their heart. They're just a, a hard generation. That's what Jeremiah's up against. It's not only a hard generation. Let me say this, it is a heedless generation. They're not only a hardened people, they are a heedless people. Jeremiah preaches, uh, Brother Raymond Jeremiah preaches for 40 years to this same crowd and he don't see revival break out. He don't see buildings built. He doesn't see converts made. After preaching for 40 years, you know how many folk Jeremiah's seen get right with God? I mean, how discouraging would that be, preacher, that you and Sister Baker give 40 years of your life to minister in this little place beside the road and if you used to stand up tonight and say, I've been here 40 years and I've never seen a soul get saved. My goodness, how discouraging that be. I've been here 40 years and I've never seen anybody get right. I've been here 40 years and I've never seen anybody change. Good gracious, what a discouraging ministry that would be. I've been here 40 years and I never saw a building built. I never saw a life change. I never saw ministries built and go forth and missionaries supported. Man, that'd be highly discouraging. That's Jeremiah's lot, friend. That's the crowd he preaches to. 40 years worth of preaching and nobody gets right. At the end of 40 years, he finds this out. People's gonna do exactly what they wanna do regardless of who's doing the preaching. You know what I found out with some people? It don't matter who's preaching. I mean, you can get the best flaming evangelists from wherever you wanna find them from, stick them in the pulpit. You can go find the greatest orator you can find, stick them in the pulpit. I mean, if Peter, James, John, John the Baptist, I mean, Brother the Apostle, so Paul and Jesus Christ himself was to stand up and preach to some people. They ain't going to get right. They ain't going to do what's being said. They're going to keep doing exactly what they want to do tonight. It's a hardened people. It's a heedless people. But here's the message tonight, and this is what broke my heart. They are a hopeless people. They're hopeless. I thought to myself, Brother Morris, maybe the reason, maybe the reason why they were heedless, maybe the reason why they were hardened is because they were hopeless. Maybe the reason why they got so hard, maybe the reason why they got to the place where they didn't care what the Bible said or what God said is because they just thought there wasn't no hope for them. Said, what's the point in going to church? What's the point in listening to the preacher? What's the point in going to the altar again? We've tried that in the past and nothing ever changed. Our situation's just the same. So we're just going to walk after our own devices. We're just going to do exactly what we want to do. May I say, if you walked into church tonight and you're in that same kind of case and you say, preacher, they just ain't no hope for my situation. There's no hope for my family. There's no hope for me. There's no hope for my 
daughter. There's no hope for my son. There's no hope for my grandkids. There's no hope for the people I've witnessed to and prayed for. There's no hope for what's broken in my life. May I say that's a lie hatched out of hell tonight as long as God sits on the throne, as long as Jesus still reigns, as long as the Bible is still true, there will always be hope tonight. There's not hope because I said there was. There's hope because the Bible says there is. There's hope because God's alive tonight and Jesus is on the throne. There's always hope, friend. I mean, brother, this book's a hope book from Genesis clear on to Revelation. As the colored preacher said, from generations to resolutions, there is hope tonight, friend. I mean, from beginning to end, there's just hope clear on through that Bible. I mean, when Adam and Eve had messed up in the garden and God had to kick them out, God gave hope in the form of a promise. He said there's going to come a seed and the serpent will bruise his heel, but he's going to bruise the serpent's head. I'm giving you all hope. When man had messed up so bad that God said, Brother Sam, I'm going to wipe them all out. God gave hope in the form of a man named Noah and the ark of safety. God gave hope to Abraham and Sarah in the form of a son named Isaac. God gave hope to Joseph in the form of a dream down in Egypt. God gave hope to his people when they were locked up in Egypt's land up by Moses the deliverer. And thank God one glorious day born in a barn in Bethlehem. An angel choir said unto you born this day in the city of David a Savior which is Christ the Lord. Hope came in the flesh. Hope born in person. And his name was Jesus tonight. There's always hope for him. Oh, that Bible said, the prophet said this. Matter of fact, it's Jeremiah that says it later on in the book of the Lamentations. He said, this I recall to my mind. Therefore have I hope. It's of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed for His compassions fail not. They're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Paul said, tribulation worketh patience. Patience worketh experience. And experience worketh hope. And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God spread abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost which he hath given unto us whatsoever things were written afore time were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope if in this life only we have hope in Christ we're of all men most miserable now about these three faith hope and charity thank God be ready to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear looking for the blessing and hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I'm glad we have hope tonight. The Bible said Christ in you the hope of glory in hope of eternal life which God who cannot lie promised before the world begin. I'm glad we serve the one that the Bible says is the God of all hope tonight. You say, preacher, I ain't sure about that hope business. I mean, I had people before come by the door and they say, I don't believe in hope. Hope is something, you know, that might happen and might not. That's not what we have. I agree. I don't believe in that stuff neither. Brother Tommy, that ain't what I'm talking about tonight. Hope in the Bible, preacher, is not a think so, maybe so. It might happen. It might not. 50-50 coin toss, chance. That is not hope in the Bible. That is not the hope I'm talking about tonight. When you read hope in the Bible, hope in the Bible is this. An expectation of future good. (laughs) Hope in the Bible is this. I know something's going to happen. I just don't know when it's going to happen. And I sit on the edge of my seat greatly anticipating Brother Joe being that God's going to do something big. That God's going to do something I can't do. I'm glad there is always hope tonight. You say, preacher, you just don't know how bad it is with me. I about give up hope. Boy, don't you never give up hope. Don't ever give up hope. I was reading here a while back. I like to my personal time, I like to read military history and such as that and all. And 
I like to read. I like to read actual. I don't read fiction. I like to read nonfiction. If I want to read something, I want it to better me. And and I was reading here a while back. Some of my personal reading found me reading. Brother told me about the Holocaust and some of the awful horrors and deprivations that was. Uh, perpetrated on the Jews in those days by Hitler and his Nazi thugs. Man, the awful things that they went through, gassed in those chambers and incinerated and awful stories. And I read about a man, his name was Mayor Hirsch. Mayor Hirsch was just a 12 or 13 year old boy when his family was taken in Europe. He and his brother and his mom and daddy and were taken to the worst death camp in World War II, which was Auschwitz. They took them folk to Auschwitz he said, when we first came in, the commandant of the camp tried to take all of our hope away. He looked at us and this is what he said. He said, none of you will make it out of this place alive. You're all going to die. He said, and true to his word, I watched as my mom and dad was pulled away from me. I never saw them again. They were executed and killed. My brother and I were able to stay together for some time, but even he was pulled away from me and they killed my brother. He said, very many times I was on my way to be gassed in the chambers and it was just the good hand of God that somehow protected me and shielded me away from the crowd and somehow miraculously I survived. When they, when they were uh, uh, rescued by the allied forces, he was nothing much more than just a, a skeleton. He was emaciated from malnutrition. And years and years later, after this awful event, they interviewed Mayor Hirsch and they asked him, they said, Mr. Hirsch, how in the world did you survive such a harrowing, horrifying, awful event? How in the world did you make it through without just giving up? And this is what the old man said. He said, sir, a man can go for days without food. He said, I, I know I've done it. A man can go for days and days without something to eat or even a long time without something to drink. He said this though, he said, but sir, a man cannot go for one minute without hope. He said, if a man ever gives up hope, he's nothing. So what got me through in those dark times was I just held on to some hope. May I say in the dark days that we're living in, sir, you're going to need some hope. I mean, you're going to need some real hope down in your soul to anchor to. You hear me, friend? I'm tickled to death tonight. I mean, glory be to Jesus and hallelujah. If I could talk in tongues, I'd do it right now. Thank God that that witch is not in the White House. Somebody say amen right there. I mean, say glory to God with me. Hallelujah. I mean, can you imagine having something that awful? If you ever think you're having a bad day, sir, just wake up and remember this. Somebody's married to her. What a good day. It'll brighten your day up just like that. Thank Thank God ain't a Miller to Hillary. Amen. Glory and hallelujah. I mean, but listen to me. But the facts is this. My hope is not in Donald Trump. No, no. My hope is not in a Republican. My hope is not a Democrat. If Hillary had got elected and all of her crazy nuts had been running the show, I'd still have hope because that ain't where my hope comes from. My hope don't come from a political party. My hope don't come from a president. My hope don't come from a pope. My hope don't come from a preacher. My hope don't come from a king. My hope is anchored in the third heaven where the Bible said which hope we have as an anchor of the soul sure and steadfast and which enters to within the veil. My rope of hope has been thrown up into the third heaven where my glory, where the Son of God sits on the mercy seat interceding for me. That's why I have hope tonight. There's always hope. Three kinds of people, real quickly, and I'm leaving. Three kinds of people that there's always hope for. Three kinds of people there's always hope for. Number one, there's hope for a vessel that's broken. There's hope for a vessel that's being broken. We'll look at our text here tonight. Jeremiah chapter number 18, the first six verses, is the classic, wonderful story of the potter and the clay. I mean, man, it's been sung about in songs and written about in poems and preached about in messages. I believe this illustration of the potter and the clay is probably the greatest illustration that God ever allowed a preacher anywhere to ever use to stick into hearts and minds. Still used today. Still goes on today. It's an amazing illustration, a visual aid of what God is trying to get across to people. Look at what God says here in verse number 2, chapter 18. Arise, go down to the potter's house. I'm going to teach you something, Jeremiah. There I will cause thee to hear my words. 
Then I went down to the potter's house. Behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred. It was broken, damaged in the hand of the potter. So he made it again, another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, What a message of hope. O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. You know what God's telling these folk? I know you think there's no hope for you because you are so broken. God knows what they're going to say later on in the text. And God's getting ahead of them and telling them, I don't care how broken you think you are. I don't care how messed up the situation you may think is. I don't care how scattered to the wind all of the pieces are. I don't care how damaged life has become. This is what I want you to know, God is saying. I am the heavenly potter and I've never met a vessel so broken. I've never met a vessel so marred. I've never met a life so damaged that I, good God Almighty, I feel like preaching, that I cannot come by and scoop up all of the pieces and put them back together again and fix them and use the vessel one more time for my glory and my honor. You might have walked in tonight and say, Preacher, I feel so broken. Preacher, my heart is broken in a million pieces. Preacher, my children are broken and scattered to the wind. Preacher, my family is broken. Preacher, my body is broken. Preacher, my finances are broken. May I say... I'd like to point you to the potter tonight. The one who scooped up a dust ball, formed it, breathed in its nostrils, the breath of life, and it became a living soul. That God has never met a heart so broken. That God has never met a situation so broken that he could not pick the pieces up, put them back together again, and do something with it that nobody else could do. There is hope for a vessel that's been broken tonight. I can't take a heart that's broken mend it over again oh but I I know a man who can and I can't take the soul that's sin sick wash it whiter than snow oh but I I know a man who can and so Call him Savior, the Redeemer of all men. I call him Jesus, for he's my dearest friend. And if you think that no one loves you and your life, it's out of hand. Oh, I, I know a man who can. I'm glad I know him tonight. I'm glad I've met him tonight. I'm glad he's my friend tonight. Now I'm telling you, if you feel broken, you can meet the one who mends broken hearts. You can meet the one who heals broken vessels. His name is Jesus tonight. He loves you so much he died on an old rugged cross, got up three days later from the grave, and he's able to save them to the uttermost that come under God by him. I don't care how dirty of a sinner you are. I don't care how low you've sunk in the mire of your sin. I don't care how bad you've spit in the face of God. I don't care how disappointed you've made mom and daddy and the preacher. I'm telling you there's a God that'll take you tonight just like that and put you back together if you'll let him free. Oh yes, oh yes. I, my, my little boy sitting down here on the front row here some time ago, several years back, he come walking into the house and uh, he, he, had, he had had some toy, some little gun or something. I don't even remember what it was, but, but it had gotten broken. He'd been outside playing with it and he'd broke it. He'd come walking in, brother. He'd just crying. he come in and said, Daddy, it's broke. And I looked at it and I said, yeah. I said, give it to me. I can fix it. I mean, I looked at it real quick and I, I surveyed it and I could tell real quick, I can fix that. I can fix it. I said, all right, son, give it to me. I'll fix it. He just sat there and tears keep running down his face. And he looks at it again. He looks at me. He looks at it and said, but daddy, it's broke. I said, I know, son. I know. 
But if you give it to me, I can fix it. One more time we went through this. He said, but daddy, it's broke. I said, son, we have established the fact that it is broken. We ain't getting no smarter talking about the fact that it's broken. It's broke. I said, now, now you can keep your toy and walk off with it broke or you can let go of it and give it to me and I can fix it if you give me some time with it. Let me take a time out and say this. There's a lot of people that come to church they don't want fixed. They just want to wallow in the brokenness. How many preachers have met folk like that? I mean, they really don't want fixed. They just like to bleed on everybody about how broken things are. They'd rather, they'd rather cry about how broken stuff is than say, God, let's get with the healing process. Let me let you fix it, God. No, some people just like, some people enjoy the brokenness. I never enjoyed that myself. I like, let's get on to the healing. Let's get on to the healing. It may take a while and it may be painful, but I don't like to be broke. Some people ain't like that. And finally, he looked at it. He cried and he looked at me. He said, all right. He handed it to me. He walked off. I walked off. I took it over to my little working station. And I'm like any good redneck daddy. I got duct tape, praise God. <laughs> Fixes everything. It does. I mean, Brother Denny, I'm going to tell you what, if you'd, sent, if you'd sent about 25 rednecks from the south to the ozone layer with a bunch of duct tape, some bailing wire, and some WD-40, we'd fix it for them just like that. we patch a hole in the ozone layer, man. We can get it done. Amen. We can knock it out like that. So I fixed it. I mean, I, I got it working again. The truth is it wasn't brand new. You could tell it had been repaired. You could tell it had been broken, but somebody had fixed it, but now it's usable again. I called him back in there and he walked in, son, when he seen that toy. What once had been broken, he had broken it. But daddy took what was broken and daddy had fixed it. Oh my goodness, eyes lit up. That toy became one of his favorite toys till he got another toy. But I mean, it becomes something special to him for a little while. You say, what made it special? It was broken, but daddy fixed it. I, 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 I'm not saying tonight that that that. God fixing your brokenness, you, you won't have scars. Or that you won't have a remembrance of how broken things are. What I'm telling you is God mends things so they can be used again. God mends, and, and may I say this, the, 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 the healing, the, the, the putting things back together, the testimony of those things makes it so precious. It makes him so precious, Brother Sam, because I look back in my own heart and in my own life, there's been places I've been broke and I could not fix it, but I brought it to God and I gave God time and time and God together fixed the broken thing in my life. And man, it makes it so precious to look back on those things and say, God did what nobody else could do. God fixed what nobody else could fix. So I encourage you tonight, you want some hope? Bring it to God. Let him fix the vessel that's been broken tonight. Amen. Secondly, not only is there hope for a vessel that's been broken, but there is hope for a victim that is bound. There is hope for a victim that is bound tonight. I don't have time to dissect all of Jeremiah chapter number 18. We, we don't have that much time this evening, but suffice it to say, Israel, God's people, are victims of their own sin. They're bound in their holding by the cords of their own iniquity. Yeah. They're so bound by their sin and they think there is so little hope with God, they just tell God in verse number 12, we, we will walk after our own devices and we will everyone do the imagination of his evil heart. God, we are, we're so bound by our own sins, we don't think you can make a difference in our life. I've, know, I've known some sinners that thought there was no hope for them because of how exceedingly sinful that they were. Yeah. Right. Holding by the cords of their own sin. I've known some Christians that had some sin creep up in their life and grab a hold of them. The Bible talks about that in 2 Timothy chapter number 2 and the end of the chapter. The Bible talks about Christians who have been taken captive by the devil. God's people save people and yet they have allowed themselves to be taken captive and holden by Satan in some area of their life. And I've met some folk, they got so held, Brother Hodges, they thought there wasn't no hope for them no more. They thought, God, they just, 
There's no hope for us. I, I'll be honest with you. If you sit here tonight and you've been praying for somebody for years and you've prayed so much. You ever been there before that you've prayed for somebody so long and you pray and things don't get better, things got worse. You ever seen that happen? You say, God, I'm praying. God, I've fasted over this thing. God, I brought them to an altar. I put them in my prayer closet. I read my Bible and I see them in verses of Scripture and I claim the promises. And God, I make a phone call to them and I find out they ain't getting closer from you. It seems like they're getting farther away. God, I watch the situation in that life and it don't seem to be getting any closer to you. It seems to just be drifting farther and farther and farther. But you just don't know what God's doing. You say, I about give up hope praying for them. Oh, there's always hope. Don't give up hope praying for them. I, I think in my own personal life, I think in my own personal life from the time I was born into this world, God afforded me the great grace and blessing to be born into a good Christian home. My mama got saved two years before I was born. My daddy got saved the year that I was born, earlier in the year. I grew up in a home where I never knew what it was like not to go to church, never knew what it was like to be around a mom and a daddy that throw beer bottles across the room, cuss each other out and run off. And I, I, I praise the Lord for that. That may not be your testimony and I'm glad that you got a testimony and that you're here. I'm just telling you mine tonight and I appreciate that. That's what I want my kids to grow up and know. We grew up in that and I never remember a time from the time I come into the world that our family would pray that we would not pray for my grandma and my grandpa Baird, my mama's mama and daddy. My grandma and papa Zorn, they were saved, but they died in the early 90s when I was just a little fella. And we prayed all my life coming up for my grandma and papa Baird. Man, I'm telling you what, I, I watched as all my life coming up, we'd invite them to church and any revivals that we had at church or anything that we had at church, a play or anything me and my brother was in, we was kids and they'd never come. And Good moral people, I mean real good moral folk, business people in the county. I mean, ha, uh, Papa served in the military for 25 years, retired as a chief master sergeant in the Air Force. Great moral folk, but moral people don't go to heaven. No. Moral folk die and go to hell every day of the week, just like that. Saved people go to heaven. Moral people don't go to heaven. Born again people go to heaven. Those that trusted Jesus tonight, they just never saw their need for that. I remember when I got saved, as a young teenager, when I got saved, I began to get in earnest about praying for my grandma and Papa Baird. God called me to preach, and, and, and I remember the first time they ever set foot in church in my lifetime, they come to hear me preach. I was preaching in Danville, Georgia. It's got to be the smallest Baptist church in America. Am I lying, Mama? I'm telling the God's honest truth. It's a littlest, honest to goodness. I ain't even making this up. I'm telling you the truth. The entire church can fit from about right here to yonder, the back wall. That's how small that place is. It fanned out like this, but I mean, you packed the place out and it was, it was packed out that night. They come to church with us. I was going up there to preach because we was passing through, going to Atlanta, Georgia on a little family trip and that's the way we bribed them into stopping at church with us because I had to preach. And they stopped in there. We packed the place out. It was only about 30 people, but praise God, it was packed out. Amen. And, and, and Grandma and Papa sat on the back row, which didn't mean a lot because it was like from right here to that wall right there. Even though they was on the back row, they still in the spit zone. Amen. And you think I'm raw now. You should have caught me when I was 18. I got up and I started preaching. I remember that night I preached out of Luke 16 on hell, just a little old simple message on hell. And I remember for the first time in my entire life, Brother Rick Parker, I watched as my Grandma and Papa on their early 70s, sat there and gripped the back of a pew. And I watched as tears got to running down my papa's face. And for the first time, I said to myself, oh, there's hope. There's hope. They didn't get right that night. But I can remember riding down the road the next day. They started asking us questions about being saved, asking me questions about the Lord. And I thought, oh, God's doing something. God's doing something. And it wasn't just a few months later, my grandma and papa showed up at our church for revival just happened in the back door had no idea they was coming hit an altar and got born again by the grace of God saved and born again we'd go over to their house after that they went and got Bibles never had Bibles in their house they sat down for the very first time in their life over 70 years old and started reading the word of God and they'd look at me and say what's this right here mean I don't understand what's that mean now, for the first time in my life I got to talk with Papa and Grandma about the scripture 
Scripture and the Word of God and talking about the Lord. And to this day, if you walk in the Emmanuel Baptist Church in Lyons, Georgia, my papa and grandma will sit right about over here on the edge of the pew. And every Sunday morning when papa or when my preacher says, let's have the ushers come forward, my papa stands up in a suit and a tie, walks down front, grabs an offering plate, plays over the offering, choir sings, he raises his hand, says praise the Lord, testifies. Every time I see him, I say there is hope, there is hope. I don't care how vile a sinner you are. I don't care how far you think they've gone. I don't care how many prayers you pray. Pray over them again. There's hope for the victim that's bound tonight. There's hope, friend. There's hope. Lastly, I'm done. I've been preaching too long. Lastly, there's not only hope for a vessel that's broken, hope for a victim that's bound, but there's hope for a voice that's bitter. There's hope for a voice that has gone bitter tonight. I want you to take your Bibles and go to the right with me to chapter number 31. Come to the right. Just a few chapters here to chapter number 31 of Jeremiah. There's hope for a voice that has gone bitter. And when we get to chapter 31, look at verse number 15 with me. Chapter 31, verse number 15. Thus saith the Lord, verse 15, chapter 31, God's going to speak again. A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel, Rahel, weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they were not, I realize, verse number 15, has prophetic implications for the day when Herod will kill thousands of children trying to kill the Christ child, trying to kill our Savior. But may I say there's practical application for you and me here tonight as well. In verse number 15, don't close your Bible. I want to show you another verse here in a minute that's going to bless you. In verse number 15, we find there is a woman that has lost something precious in her life and the loss of something precious has made her bitter. Now I want to take time out and say this. Anytime you lose something precious, whether it is the loss of a loved one or it's the loss of some joy in your life, the loss of some passion in your life, just the loss of anything precious can make you bitter. That's right. You ever lost something precious? And, and let, let me say this. It is not difficult to get bitter. As a matter of fact, it is highly natural to get bitter. The natural man wants to fall into bitterness when some good thing has been removed out of life. It is not hard to get bitter. It's hard not to get bitter. Would you agree with me there? I mean, I find myself fighting getting bitter at people. Bitter at circumstances. And if you've lived for God for any length of time at all, you might put on your religious mask and act real spiritual tonight because you got your church clothes on and you're in church. But uh, I mean, I know Baptists don't like to be honest when they're in church. But, but come on, it's just us. Let's be honest tonight. If you've lived for God any length of time, been through a few things, there's been times you've had to fight even getting bitter at the Lord. Yes, sir. I mean, where you just didn't understand what's going on and didn't like what God done, and you had to fight that. That old man wants to. This woman has lost something precious, and it's making her bitter. Let me say this tonight. If you are in that case where you've lost something in your life and it's about to make you bitter, you say, Preacher, is there any hope that I'll ever come out of this, this fog, this This darkness, is is there hope for this? It's hanging over my head. There is hope for you. I want you to to notice verse 16 with me. Watch verse 16. Hope is not in this life though. If you are looking for hope here, you are going to be discouraged. Look at where God said hope was. Thus saith the Lord, refrain thy voice from weeping, thine eyes from tears. For thy work shall be rewarded, saith the Lord. And they shall come again from the land of the enemy. Watch verse 17. I love this. I want you to see this. You remember what God's people said to God in chapter 18, verse 12? Remember what they said? There's no hope. God comes back about 13 chapters later. God said, I want to tell y'all something. Y'all said there ain't no hope. Let me tell y'all something. Verse 17, this is God talking. And there is hope. Hope. Say, where's the hope at? Look at what he says. In thine end, 
saith the Lord, thy children shall come again to their own border. This is where God said hope is. He said hope ain't here. Hope's there. Hope's not down here. It's in the end. That's where our hope is. We are not living for this world. We are living for another world. If you are looking for hope here, you're going to be discouraged. You know the only place you can find hope? You got to reach up into another world and lay hold on it in that world. And say, oh, this world is dark and this world's lonely. And this world's bitter and this world's tough. But I'm giving you some good news tonight. There is another world. The choir sang about it. We sung about it in the special singing. Brother Denny sung about it. Sung about heaven over and over. That's where hope is. Hope's in the end, friend. Amen. Boy, the Bible said, if in this life we had hope in Christ, if this is all we had, we're of all men most miserable. Listen while I'm finna tell you all tonight. If your only hope is in your 70 or 80 year existence on planet earth, if your only hope is in an IRA, a retirement account, a few thousand dollars in the bank, a nice house, a good car, a nice clothes and staying relatively comfortable, if that's your only hope, you got a miserable life. That's it. You are most, you are of all men most miserable. You are a miserable creature tonight. I'm going to tell you what I got that's different than that. I got hope of eternity. I've got hope of a day where we'll never say goodbye. I've got hope of a day when there'll never be another wheelchair, brother. I've got hope of a day where we won't need eyeglasses. I've got hope of a day where we won't need pacemakers and we won't need artificial hips and limbs and knees. I've got hope of a day when there'll never be no more cancer. I've got hope for a day when there'll never be another hospital. I've got hope for a day when there'll never be another wayward son, another wayward daughter. Hope's up yonder, friend. Yes, it is. Sister, would you come play something for us? You get to the piano. You can play something for us softly there if you don't mind. I'm telling you tonight, there's always hope. Yes, it is. See, I don't know where you're at, but you might have got to the place where you might give up hope. But there's always hope. I'm going to tell you this, and we're going. I was reading some time ago, in the early days of submarining, there was a submarine in the early 1900s that had been commissioned by the Navy and it was titled the USS S-4. The S-4 was doing maneuvers off the coast of the eastern seaboard up in the northeast. Before the days of sonar and things of this nature, they didn't know what was above them when they were submerging except to raise the periscope. They had missed a large fishing vessel that was crossing over their path. The USS S-4 began to come out of the water and made contact with that boat opening up a six foot wide gap in the hull. Immediately they began to take on water and the boat dove to the bottom of the ocean floor almost 200 feet trapping all of the sailors inside the S4. They began to send rescue divers down to try and see if they could salvage the lives of those men and rescue them out of their perilous condition. Hour after hour they began to work on the Submarine, knowing that it was losing oxygen rapidly in the compartments. The men were trapped. After hours of trying to rescue them, but to no avail, they heard tapping on the inside of the hull of the vessel. Those trapped men were sending Morse code back out to the outside. One of the last messages they heard from the inside, they heard tapping after several hours, and it said this, Is there any hope. Is there any hope? And they said one of them divers had the sense enough to Morse code back and he pulled a wrench out of his pocket and he began to knock on the hull of that vessel and this was the message he sent back to them folk trapped in the submarine. He said this, there is always hope. There is always hope. I don't know how down low you are tonight or in what kind of dark shape you're in tonight or somebody that you know is, but I wonder if we could not tune in our heart and hear the Morse code from heaven. Could we not hear the tapping of the Holy Ghost on our heart? You, you know what that sound is you've been hearing? You know what that feeling is you've been feeling in your heart? That's the Holy Ghost saying this. There's always hope. You've been 
knocking on heaven's door saying, God, is there any hope? God says, oh yeah, always hope. Always hope. Let's all stand tonight for prayer. Father, give us hope in our soul. We are living in such hopeless days, God. I'll be honest. You turn the TV on, you read the news on the internet. Lord, I even hang around churches sometimes and I look on faces and I just see hopelessness. Just give up. Quit. Oh, some folk hadn't quit coming to church service. They hadn't quit singing in the choir. They hadn't quit sitting on the pew, but you can look in their face and read their heart and just see giving up hope. God, tonight I pray that you would fill our souls with the hope of heaven. Remind us once again, there's always that expectation of future good. Because you said there was. Not because I say there is. Not because some psychiatrist said there was or some doctor, but because the doctor of heaven said there was. Help us, I pray. Bless this church, this dear pastor, and these good people in Jesus' name. Amen. If you need to come tonight, maybe you just need a little bit of hope. Maybe you might give up hope. Maybe you've quit praying for something you used to pray for. Quit praying for somebody you used to pray for. And you've watched them get worse and worse and worse. And you just say, preacher, there's no hope. Oh, take them to the cross one more time. Take them to the Lord one more time. Pray for them again. Don't you give up hope. Don't you do that. There's always hope. Preacher, man, it's yours. I'd like for you to take your songbook and turn to 477. We'll be dismissing just as we get this 477. Let's sing it. to you verse 2 when darkness veils his lovely face I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy oh, gale yes, my anchor holds within the veil his oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood when all around my soul gives way he then is all my what? hope and stay Amen. Now let's sing verse four and we'll be dismissed. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, Don't forget tomorrow night we'll have supper 
at 5.30, church at 7, then Thursday at 7 also. I do appreciate again you members being here. We do have several members not here tonight for various reasons, but thank you visitors for coming. You have really honored us with your visit. I hope you'll come again as soon as you can. Amen. And be careful going home. It's been a good night, hasn't it? Amen. So a lot of folks go to church and they hear an hour and a half of singing and 10 minutes of preaching. Go home and say, what a good service we had. I like good singing, but I'm going to tell you, you can't beat great preaching of the word of God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, dismiss us now. Lord, as we go our separate ways. And Lord, uh, there's no telling how many in, in this room tonight needed this message. Lord, I pray they'll never give up. They'll always have that hope from above. I pray you'll help them get some rest tonight, Lord, for some weary soul. And Lord, there'll be one here who's not yet saved. I pray, God, before they leave the premises, they'll come back in, make their way to me or somebody and say, I need to be saved. So, Lord, we ask you now to watch over us. Help us, dear God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.